From the beginning of Montana's distinctive yet troubled history, the Treasure State was dominated, both economically and politically, by powerful outside interests who shipped in capital and bought control of the state. Historians tell us that as the Anaconda Company and its friends ran Montana, economic and political power flowed out into the hands of distant capitalists and corporations. Policy was determined in far off New York City and control of the press was rigid. Anaconda's corporate dominance in Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. For its first 75 years, Montana was a one company state. But then big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Between 1965 and 1980, Montanans ripped off their copper collar, transforming Montana from a corporate colony into a free modern state. The people finally controlled their own destiny. The pitched battle between the people and the established power structure was not easily won, but fired in a crucible of change. A new Montana was born. Join Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time as they shine a light on this remarkable era. Welcome back to In the Crucible of Change. You know, as we approach the end of this series, we're taking time to look back a little bit at some things. We'll look back at the changes that took place and take under consideration where we are at the present and what the future looks like. Uh, now, we're in a particularly important time right now. If you think of it from a historical perspective, we had the first progressive era of Montana at the turn of the century for 15, 20 years of good progressive activity in this state. And then there was a retrenchment for about 40 plus years where we were clearly, I had the copper collars stuck around our neck and tightened ever so tightly every year after year after year. And then there was the breakout during the crucible of change from 1965 to 1980, where this massive amount of change that we've been talking about had taken place. Change that really uh, changed the nature of the state of Montana. It empowered citizens. Uh, uh, we moved away from corporate dominance to kind of a people-oriented state. And that's been the hallmark of Montana since that time. But as we note in the introduction, the battle against the established power structure at that time was not easily won. And retaining the gains of that time are an equal challenge because year in and year out, uh, forces that lost power during the crucible of change period are seeking to recapture that power, to tilt the playing field, to change the social policies, uh, to reallocate the way public money and public sentiment will go. So we have uh, a, a real uh, interesting period that we're sitting in right now at this, at this particular time. So we, we like to call this program, you know, advance to the rear because that's what we think a lot of people want to have us do. Go back, go back to the way things were. But the way things were wasn't all that nice before the period of change. So. We have a very interesting panel we have today, uh, people who are seasoned veterans of politics and government and also significant involvement in private sector activity as well. Uh, these three panelists are all good close friends of mine, so I have to confess to that and uh, uh, I, I hope we're a mutual admiration society because I certainly admire all three of them and that's why they're here to talk to us today about this look back. You know, uh, first, now, uh, to my immediate right here is Hal Harper. Uh, Hal is, was 26 years in the legislature, several times as majority leader. You were Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, you started in the legislature in 73 and, and, uh, and you spent 26 years there. We've known each other, worked together for 42 years. Uh, uh, Hal served as a legislator for both political parties, was in both caucuses. Uh, he was, in addition to that, for six years, the chief policy advisor for Governor Brian Schweitzer. He's been a private contractor, home builder, for many, many years uh, from Helena. So, Hal, welcome to In the Crucible of Change. Thank you, Evan. And Let me uh, also add that um, for at least one year before I was elected to the legislature, I was a janitor at the Capitol Complex. Ah, you know and what's I really happening to, there. I love to make those toilets shine. <laughs> <laughs> and Sheena Wilson, to his right is Sheena Wilson. 
Uh, she and I have known each other and worked together since 1969 with executive reorganization. We were in the initial staff with reorganization. Uh, when her chores there were completed, she went with a, a multi-state family education program for a number of years, and then a significant stint in Congress, working both in Washington, D.C. and in Helena, Montana for Montana Congressman Pat Williams. Uh, she was a very successful private business woman, ran a nice restaurant and shop. By the way, great cook, I will say that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, back into state government where she worked for the state auditor for a number of years and then uh, eight years as the chief or as the deputy chief of staff for Governor Brian Schweitzer. So uh, welcome Sheena. Thank you for having uh, me back Evan. From Dutton, Montana. From Dutton, Montana. Bringing uh, some Dutton sensibility to right. our, our considerations here. Some farm, farm yeah. sensibilities. Yeah. And Dan Bucks. Uh, Dan uh, has been active in the arena for that same 46 years starting in 1969 working for a Democratic Party, actually at that time in South Dakota, and for the governor, the administration of Governor Richard Knaip in South Dakota, uh, after which he found his way to Montana a long time ago, back in the early, uh, in, in the 1970s. Uh, spent some time at UM, uh, worked for the National Conference of State Legislators, uh, and then was with the State Revenue Department in the, most of the 1980s under Governor Schwinden. Uh, and then headed up the Multi-State Tax Commission, one of the top uh, entities in taxation in the United States for 17 years, as I remember, uh, prior to coming here. And then you were revenue director under Governor Schweitzer for the full eight years. So these guys bring a huge welcome, by the way. Well, well, thank you for inviting me here. And it, uh, it's always a pleasure to visit with you and Hal and Sheena and others. So well, you. you know, what we're interested in is your perceptions with all this experience you've had You've seen and are conscious of the way things were, the changes that took place, and the challenges now to erode those changes. And I, I want to start because I think it's, it, it's very, very interesting, uh, Sheena, with you, about when we talk about women's issues, when we talk about, uh, you know, people trying to take away and is there a war on women? But before we can tell if there's a war on women now, what was it like before the crucible of change if you were a young woman in Montana in the mid-60s? Well, Evan, as it happens, I managed to dig out the little book that the University of Montana provided to incoming freshmen the year I started school at Missoula in 1965. And this document sort of gives, might give folks a little inclination as to how far we've actually come in 50 years. Um, one of the quotes in here about clothing policies, Slack, this is for women, of course. Slacks may be worn on campus only on Saturdays before 6 p.m. or for sporting events. And it goes on and on like this, including a chart. There's quite the little chart in here that has all this information about what women should wear. And this little bit of information over here about what men might well, that could wear. be that men were a little slow on the uptake. Well, but it's but also <laughs> <laughs> now. So, by the way, does this sound a little bit like a, a recent uh, bill that might have been introduced <laughs> in the legislature about what kind of pants women should have and what type of uh, neckline? And right. We, you know, we think we've come a long way since then, but uh, you know, we we need to remember how bad. It, well, I shouldn't say how bad, but how it was in 1965 did for they, women. What did it did say they, in there about about? why women would might want to go to college. Well, why college, it says. And it talks about opportunity to make something of yourself and it lists a couple other things and then it says, or perhaps you came just to find a man, a good man and settle down. Whoa. So, <laughs> you know, that was, that was the sensibility of 1965. You know, and it was, of course, in local parentis, they were looking after us and women had very, very strict hours. The men had no hours, you know, the, the dorms were opposite of each other. I mean, it was just ridiculous. But. Yeah, it was. Well, and I think it's important for folks to recognize because if you're of the generation that only knows what's been around for the last 30 years, yeah. you don't recognize how far we came from that kind of stuff, but how perilously close we might be to returning to some of it. When I sent my son off to college, I had him read this, and he re refused to believe me that this was a real. That this a real been, document. This yeah. is a real document. This is you not must have made that fiction. up. This is very this real. This is not fiction. This and, is what and so today, if you look at the uh, women in Montana who have uh, rights that are laid out 
uh, in the Montana Constitution and in statute that were most of which were passed during the period of the crucible of change. Uh, you know, what's happening to that? Is there a kind of a war on women going on right well, now? Well, we, we have come a long way, but um, uh, as you know, the governor uh, recently re reactivated the task force on uh, pay equity, and uh, Montana still sits number 37 for equality of pay between men and women. Um, if you count only those people earning full-time work, which is the most generous way to use it, uh, we're at 75 percent. And there's no industry in Montana that pays women more than men. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's still the way it was. And it, well, it's better. It used to be 59 cents. So we still so have we're a ways to go on the equity issue we, without yeah. question. <laughs> right. Now, on, uh, we've done kind of well on one front. On the election. Which is the election. election of women officials. And um, I'm we happy to report. We, in, our, in our previous session on, on, on women's rights in this uh, series, uh, the point was made that we had they were like three women in the 1969 legislature and two in the 1971. Right. But then with the CONCON, we kind of exploded out with 19, almost 20 percent were women. But that broke the barrier, so to speak. And how, how, right. do, how will you stand on well, that? Well, I was stuff? happy to note that this year, uh, Montana jumped into the top 10 of states with the percentage of women in the legislature. We now have almost one-third women. I mean, I'd obviously like to see it half, but we have one-third, which is certainly a lot better than a lot of other states. The lowest states are in the teens, so 15, 12, some 11 percent. And so we're at... Um, so we made progress on that front and, right. and the constitutional front. But where's the erosion? What's, what's, what's happening with women's rights in this state? The erosion largely has to do, I think, with access to uh, health. reproductive health care yeah. and health care in general. Obviously, the Medicare expansion will be helpful, but women in Montana have difficulties accessing health care, uh, reproductive health care, extremely so. Um, and what I find alarming is in the talk of um, the abortion issue, which of course remains a hot button issue, um, is that many states have passed um, laws related to, they call them, call it uh, feticide and personhood. And under those statutes, um, I've been alarmed to read discussions about the number of women who are being criminalized, prosecuted under those statutes uh, for what a woman may think is a miscarriage. She may have taken a drug that wasn't appropriate or something and uh, she was prosecuted. There's one woman that was sentenced to 41 years in jail. The case is obviously being appealed and the you know people hope that that will be sent back, but there was another case where a woman was prosecuted who botched a suicide and in the process lost her fetus, and she was prosecuted under those feticide laws. And so, so I'm very concerned that that these um, that com those criminalization back, these are, of that, huh? Yeah, that yeah. there's that that issue, the the freedom of women's choice in healthcare is is being eroded. Well, and, you know the the the, uh, the right of privacy is very very strongly right. written into the Montana Constitution. Most of this stuff relates to the right of privacy, but that doesn't stop the legislature from trying to make some moves on it. Were you going to say something? Well, you know, this is an issue that is still around that I guess I thought would be solved by this point in time. When I started in 1973, this was one of the first issues that I was involved in, was Roe versus Wade, which had just happened. And the legislature did not want to pass a progressive law at that time. Um, people in this state, I think, have been stuck with a regressive law, but the courts always allowed people to look after their own reproductive health care. It, it just occurs to me, the legislature, they are the policy makers. They're the ones that decide when life begins. Now, we've got a policy that life begins at birth. And that's why you have birth certificates. If life begins at conception, Who's going to issue the, concep the conception certificates, and how are they going to know? <laughs> well, you know, uh, one could be flippant about that, but in fact, it's a serious question. It's very the, serious the, question. The, if those if those bills pass and they're upheld by the courts, 
It is important to note that these, ev these things that have happened in other states, they haven't happened in Montana, but that doesn't mean there haven't been a lot of bills put in no, to make it happen. there has been a lot of so bills. So at this point, aren't there a lot of activities in the legislature where people are having to fight back against yes. these uh, kind of radical changes that would put politicians instead of doctors in charge of the decisions about women's bodies? Right. And it's happening all across the country. It's uh, so it's a threat everywhere, <laughs> including Montana right yeah. now. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's an important area. Uh, a big area, you know, when, when, I, when I watch, observe the legislative process and I watch how the news reports on the legislature, especially now that I'm kind of back out of the mainstream of that activity, it's, it's that the most important uh, issues the, from the re what gets reported in the paper are taxes. And maybe that's because everybody takes a, writes a check for taxes or takes money out of their pocket. Taxes seem to be a really important issue. They almost are usually the fulcrum upon which things happen in the legislature. And some changes occurred in the Constitution uh, on our tax structure that were really, really progressive. But there has been a serious effort, continuing ongoing effort to erode many of those. Dan, what happened to the Constitution quickly? And then well, how do we... Well, first of all, let me let me do a big picture thing, which is is that historically Montana has had a reasonably progressive ta progressive tax system, one in which the uh, legislature you know, I, w I would label it a sustainable and equitable system up to a certain point, and the legislature would decide each year what the priority public needs were and then would try to match the revenues with those particular needs in a sustainable and equitable way. And Montana has always con been concerned about equity, but the 1972 Constitutional Convention, to get to your question, reinforced that in a couple of ways. One of it was, one, and one particular way, was to strike a blow for greater equity in property taxation, to make sure that everybody's property was valued as equally as possible, individuals and businesses. And, and that the, the, the tax payments for property taxes were distributed as equitably uh, uh, as possible among all taxpayers. That was, uh, and, and the 1972 Constitutional Convention created a statewide system of valuation to, guarantee, to help guarantee that equity. It also gave expanded rights to citizens to be able to uh, independently appeal their property taxes, which is important uh, from the standpoint of making sure that the the property tax system works well and effectively, but the whole when you and but when you also read the constitutional convention transcripts, you find out that the delegates to that convention were very concerned about equality of taxation overall, that everybody contribute uh, in relation to their ability to pay and the benefits that they receive, and everyone includes the businesses as well that enjoy substantial benefits from an educated workforce, from laws that guarantee the functioning of contracts and of free markets, and infrastructure that benefits businesses as well, as well as remediating environmental problems that are caused by certain kinds of, uh, of act economic activities. And so uh, Montana, and because Montana also has rejected historically a sales tax, Montana has had a more progressive tax system than the rest of the country, reinforced by the 72 Constitutional I Convention. I think even right now we're considered the second most fair tax structure to regular people in the, in the, in the nation. First but, or second, yeah, but yeah. Which, which, which is relative because in fact right. all of the state and local systems are getting less equitable than they used to be, right. which is a national trend. They're sliding all, backwards. They're, yeah. they're sliding backwards and, and we're still holding our own but we're not as equitable as we used to be, and right. that's true of all states, mm -hmm. nationally and he here in Montana. So there's a and real onslaught by, by mm -hmm. is it fair to say maybe the wealthy and corporate interests? What, the one percent and the and the uh, uh, and the corporate interests, and in and in, in particularly in the late '90s here in Montana, several things happened to cut property taxes for uh, large corporations, tax rates. Uh, expanded exemptions, one in particular, a very broadly and vaguely written uh, exemption for intangible taxes, that uh, intangible property that can, corporations can use to, to uh, decrease their, uh, their property taxes significantly, whereas others can't. And uh, the, 
and also a, a special deal for the, the major railroads in the state uh, and other measures. And that by the way, is it, I, I, being it's a kind of a zero-sum game, if those folks pay less in property taxes, it shifts over to Absol regular homeowners. Exactly what happened. There was a property tax shift that started happening at that particular time. Now, now the, um, uh, because of those particular measures. Then in 2003, there was, a, and this was all under, no, let's, let's, let's do the, the big picture thing again. If before we had a kind of sustainable and equitable fiscal path of trying to figure out what the priority public needs were and then funding it in a sustainable, adequate, and equitable way. By the late 90s, and this had come earlier in the 80s nationally, there was this notion that, well, no, really, all you have to worry about is giving tax incentives to the, to the, to the very wealthy and to corporations, and they'll make the rest of us rich. Uh, you call it trickle-down, call it supply-side, whatever. And we began to practice it in the late 90s a bit here in Montana with those property tax changes, and also in 2003. This was the famous, what George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush one, called voodoo economics. Lower taxes, more money. But right. it didn't work that way? It didn't work that way. <laughs> and it didn't work that way in Montana. In fact, you cannot trace uh, any economic benefits directly to the tax cuts that were put in place. In, in particular, in 2003, the, um, uh, there was legislation to roll back the top rates on the income tax in Montana and also add a capital gains tax credit. It went into effect in 2005. A hundred million dollars was the cost that was spent on those tax reductions. Half of that, not quite half of it, went to 1,500 households in Montana that earned over a half a million dollars a year. Uh, 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 Didn't the little guy get a break? Well, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, down at the lower end, uh, enough to buy an extra cup of coffee every week, uh, every other week, or something like that. Uh, and some people in the middle actually had their taxes increased out of this change. But nonetheless, and then um, uh, after five years, the tax, income tax breaks for the wealthiest Montanans had cost the state about $250 million in revenue that could have spent on been spent on education to help both improve the quality of education and to keep property taxes down for everybody. But instead, it was spent on these incentives for supposed, supposedly economic growth. So we look, we look back at what happened as a result of this. We look back as to whether or not those who had benefited most actually went, uh, created new jobs in Montana. And we couldn't find any evidence. We looked as to whether or not the businesses they owned had actually created jobs. And the answer is we could not find the evidence for that. And secondly, the other thing that those tax cuts were supposed to do on those income tax cuts was to enable more, uh, was to incentivize, that's the incentive word, wealthy people to either stay here or to come to Montana and make the rest of us rich by being, just simply by apparently being here and, um, and that. And when you looked at the migration data in and out, it was a wash. There was no change. So $250 million spent in the name of incentives for investment and absolutely no measurable economic impact that could be found well, from that, that. Has that satisfied the appetite of the wealthy and the corporations for no. more tax cuts? No, there's, there's always <laughs> pressure to cut the, the rates and do more and to say the same thing, that if you just give us a little bit more, we'll make you all rich with our investments. But when you actually bore down into the data, it hasn't happened. It doesn't work. Instead, what happens is you have less money to invest in the things that help everybody lift themselves up. Education and infrastructure and the kind of human services that enable people to progress forward and contribute to society. Would you, would you suggest that, or agree maybe, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe one of the reasons why uh, I mean, this is an ongoing battle. Year after year after year, the legislature meets. There's always someone in looking for a special deal. And, and when that happens, uh, is that not a product of 
average citizens don't have lobbyists. Those that need to want special deals have a cadre of lobbyists that lurk around the hallways and try yeah. to get it done. Yes, it, it is, and certainly the power, the power of those who have resources, corporations and the wealthy, to have their voices heard is much easier. But there's another part of this that I want to point out, Evan, yep. here as well, that has to do, go back to the 1972 Constitution. The best, uh, uh, the, the best, uh, the, the best uh, uh, one of the best things in the 72 Constitution is the reinforcement of the public's right to know. But the public doesn't know enough about how the tax system works. And among other things, we need to, um, uh, we need to uh, open up key data from corporate tax returns so that people can see who is paying and who isn't paying taxes and why, and if credits and tax breaks are enacted, whether or not they're working or not. There isn't enough information available to the citizens about the operation of the tax system in terms that they can understand. All they're told is very complicated things. It needs to be simple. Who is paying what? Is it fair? Is it equitable? And if you're going to give a special break, does it actually produce a result or not? Mm -hmm. And we're and and again, it it it, it it's fair to say that uh, this assault continues every session. I mean, it's it's constantly there. So mm -hmm. vigilance is probably yeah. you know necessary. You know, as we when we look at the crucible of change period. Uh, it was basically a, common, uh, a, a decision by Montanans saying, uh, we don't want to continue the way we've done things when it came to, that was a new word back then, the environment. But what it spoke of was a quality of life for Montanans, that after years of the Copper Kings and everything else where uh, nobody seemed to either know or care and all the degradation that occurred, uh, there was a period during, during the period of change uh, that, uh, where we tightened up regulations, how we did things. Let's touch on that a little bit, and that's an area under constant assault, it seems like now. Well, you mentioned the first progressive era mm -hmm. in Montana's history, and the second one really began, I think, with the new constitution in 1972. And my father was a delegate, and uh, after they passed you know, adopted the Constitution. He traveled the state, sometimes along with his friend Betty Babcock, who was former First Lady, also wanted to pass the Constitution. Dad would say, praise the Lord and pass the Constitution. And Betty um, was, was very persuasive. That was really the big progressive bang that started this era that you're, that you're talking about. In those days... Well, and the Constitution actually had language saying we should have a clean environment. It started out saying citizens have a right to a clean and healthful environment. That's something that's become very controversial here in recent years. But in those days, there was no environmental lobby, really. There was one environmental group, I think it was the, the Hunters and Anglers, it was the Montana Wildlife Association, I think they had one professional person. I don't think any other environmental group had any professionals working up there, they were all volunteers. But this was a combination of citizens, farmers, ranchers, women's group especially, Native Americans, mm -hmm. people coming together, educators big time, coming together and saying, Wait a minute, we've got, I think it was 36 new coal power plants planned for eastern Montana. Let's get on top of this. Um, so George, a whole slew of things came out of that. George Darrow was a Republican senator. He carried the Montana Environmental Policy Act, passed unanimously in one of the houses. Francis Bardnov carried the Major Facility Siting Act. Coal severance taxes were enacted. The people of the state decided they would put away that coal severance tax, at least half of it, for future generations, and that still lives today. The trust fund, the coal trust the fund. The coal tax trust fund. Hard Rock Mining Act, Strip Hard Mine Rock Reclamation Act. Later, um, Water. Bans, bans on radioactive uh, waste. Um, there would be no nuclear plants in the state of Montana. Hard Rock Mining Act that you mentioned, so schools and local governments knew with a little certainty that they could have a little money and knew how to plan. and the water bills especially. 
Now, if you'd have told me in 1973, when the Water Use Act was passed, that by this time in 2015, we wouldn't have all our streams and rivers adjudicated, I'd have said, what's the use? But we found it's a major task, bigger than anyone had thought. We're well down that line, we have water courts now, and it is something that absolutely has to be done. But right now, I think people are becoming re-aware of environmental changes and how they affect the state of Montana, how they affect agriculture. Don't forget the part that agriculture played back when Clyde Jarvis Montana was a Farmers public Union. service yeah. commissioner and on the Farmers Union and had a program called Featuring the Facts. Yeah. And he urged farmers and ranchers to be aware of what pollution might be doing to their, to their livestock and to their crops. And, and certainly farmers and ranchers were a part of this coalition. This was before any of the real environmentalist groups even got going. Well, you know, this, I think it's probably a, a reasonable description that there was va a total vacancy of any kind of uh, uh, environmental regulation of any substance in Montana prior to this period of change. Very, very little. And then a lot of stuff was enacted that protected Montana each one of those, in one way or another, has had some assault on it, and they've been success. There's been success in some areas. Yes. The Environmental Policy Act's been re uh, weakened somewhat. Very much. The Facility weakened. Siting Act has been weakened somewhat. Water is this quality. an ongoing? Is this an ongoing thing? Water quality, uh, mixing zones uh, have entered in, and now you know. I guess the most famous one now is this new copper mine that's going to go in on one of the tributaries of the Smith River going to go in on Sheep Creek, and that's where, where some of the emphasis is now. Um, yes, there is weakening of a number of environmental laws. People need to pay attention because don't forget what the Montana Environmental Policy Act did. It gave citizens the right to protect the areas they live in. It gave them the right to have a say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Let's dive in for a second to a great big picture item here. I don't know who wants to get into this first, but one of the most important things that government does in Montana is provide a good public education, K through 12, and a public university system. And there was a lot of changes occurred uh, in the Constitution and since then in terms of government gover uh, governance of education in terms of equality, of uh, equalization of, of taxation so that people got an equal education with equal money. Uh, and uh, uh, that's always a bone of contention because it's money. The main way the state, since there's local control of schools, the main way the state impacts education is money. And money means taxes. And there's the rub. So where are we on education in terms of its funding and efforts to maybe divert that money to other uses and so on? Anybody want to take a whack at that? I mean, I, I think we have, uh, we, in the Constitution, we have a thing that says you shouldn't spend money on sectarian schools, and yet it seems like every year we have a governor either having to veto or legislate. They're trying to say you should give money for tuition assistance and uh, what do you call them, vouchers and stuff for going to non-public schools? Well, Montana has a stronger commitment. Let's, 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 let's be clear about this. Montana has a stronger commitment historically to public education than a number of other states, and that's something that Montana can be proud of. Um, uh, the, the issue primarily, uh, I think, is in the question of the adequacy of the funding. Uh, you, you can go to other states and you can find that there are uh, great ex experiments being engaged in of taking money out of public schools and putting it into vouchers and charter schools and uh, big tax credits for a private school education. And I know there's proposals in Montana for doing those sorts of things. When you go to the other states and look at, uh, at uh, the things that have happened there, you, you, in the name of supposed progress, you can't really find the progress. Uh, Montana has avoided some of those, uh, uh, those kinds of situations and circumstances. But what Montana 
uh, it's, it's always difficult, especially in a context, and I think it's wrapped up with the question of the rising inequality and the, fail and, and the pressures on the middle class and the changes in the tax system where the wealthier and the larger corporations maybe aren't uh, paying quite the same share that they used to and the, and the burden of taxes has been shifted to the ordinary citizen. All of that leads to cost pressures for the payment of education. And, if there's, and it's because of the, the uh, uh, you, you need to maintain a progressive tax system where all those who benefit from the results of the educational system, which includes businesses and corporations, pay a fair share so that there's adequacy of funding for the overall system. Certainly there should be accountability, and those are always important discussions as to how accountability happens. But I think that's the, in, me, in my judgment, the issue in Montana has primarily been the question of whether or not the funding is sufficient and whether or not the results are occurring that people are satisfied with. But who pays the bill is important because if the tax burden is shifted to the ordinary citizen and those who have a greater ability to pay or those who benefit in terms of an educated workforce, in terms of business operations, are not paying their fair share, it means that the ordinary citizen is paying more for perhaps a lesser educational system. Well, uh, if, if uh, the challenge is always, is there enough money at the state level to adequately fund the state's share of public education costs in Montana? And someone suggests, why don't we take 20, 30, 40 million dollars away from that? And unless the legislature backfills it, which doesn't, isn't likely well, to the happen. Property, the property taxes will just go uh, up instead. And uh, the other but, point but is... What it, what it does do is, and that's the challenge today as I see it, is uh, I want to have my child taught in a school that is religious, that's got my values that I want to impart upon them. I have to pay money on the side for that beyond my taxes. I want the taxpayer to help me advance the religious education of my children. I mean, that's the crux of the issue, and that's also what's in the Constitution of Montana. It says you can't do it, but it doesn't stop the assault from taking place. Don't we see this every year? Well, uh, well you do, but Dan is making a very important point about taxes here. And you see these bills, there's another bill to cut business equipment taxes, which are school taxes. People need to know when those bills pass, it is they that pay for them because the property tax game is zero sum. Someone's gonna pay. Or alternatively, and I know I, I understand, Evan, that you're asking another question that's important. If, you, if over that five year period, and which continues to this day for the next five years and what have you, the quarter of a billion dollars, the $250 million had been, let's say half of it was, was, uh, was, uh, was taken uh, and, and distributed as a, a, a reduction to ordinary citizens on the, from their taxes. But the other half investment invested in education at all levels instead of being wasted on some su supposed incentives for investment that had, that had no result. Just think what the, you know, the, the results could have been from investing that kind of money in, in programs that work in terms of public education. Now you either believe in public schools as the great democratizing institution. You know, there's a history here. In, in, we, the, 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 the United States became a great nation in part because state and local governments decided to, to send local governments in particular, the citizens of this country, decided to send the high school aged population to high school for the first time in the 1920s and 30s. It was, the, it was the high school movement across the country. And communities competed to build high schools and to send their kids to schools. In the depth, depths of the depression, states were adding taxes Mm -hmm. to be able to build high schools and send people to, to, um, uh, to high school for the first time. By the eve of World War II, we were the only um, uh, advanced uh, country in the, in, in the world that had sent 
half of its high school, edu a, a, a high school population actually to school. Now what had, <coughs> what's important here, not in Germany, not in England, those countries all lagged behind. They hadn't even reached 20, 25% of their high school age population going to high school. On the eve of World War II, this country had the most educated population in the world. We could mobilize for World War II in part because of having this highly educated population that could be both trained for warfare, the, the, the war itself, and trained for the jobs that needed to be done here at home. After the end of World War II, state and local governments increased taxes to build the most amazing public higher educational system anywhere in the world and continued to expand elementary and secondary education until the 1980s when we began to slip in comparison to the other nations of this world. Now we became a world power in no small part because of the investments in state and in public education, public schools, using new tax dollars that were, uh, that, that were levied to, to accomplish that particular result. And much of our, and at the same time, we were making huge investments in new infrastructure. That also slowed down in the 1980s. And as a nation, as state and local governments cut back on their relative commitments to public education and to infrastructure, as that happened, our nation's growth rate declined and inequality among our citizens in terms of economic results increased. We regressed as a society because we were no longer willing to make those kinds of investments and instead went down this path of incentivizing individuals uh, personally to do certain things, supposedly to make investments or to go to private schools or what have you. We use this incentives approach, which got us off track in this country. Mm -hmm. Well, no, all this is uh, uh, clearly an ongoing thing. And the one thing that impacts inequality of pay for women, education. Mm -hmm. You narrow that gap. The higher level of education you go, the narrower the gap becomes. So education is vitally important to making. So I think its bottom line is this is an area with big money, uh, uh, big efforts to divert money, uh, both in terms of just less taxes or just taking money from the treasury and helping pay for sectarian interests for religious schools. Uh, I would say that as someone who worked in the political arena, I've noted that the, those that want to accomplish something that doesn't seem to fit find a, a nice way with words to do it. Nobody stands up and says, I want you to pay for my child's religious education. They use words like school choice. choice. Right. Well, people have the choice to go to any school they want right now. It's not about choice. It's about, are you going to get pays. public money? That's the issue. And so, but let's, let's but we've got a, a lot to cover there. here. Uh, there's a, one more. There's a vision here, Evan, of, of of actually moving this country, advancing to the rear, back to the time before William McKinley. There are people who actually want to do that and repeal the 20th century. And part of that is that they want to go back to the days when there were not s substantial public educational institutions and it was a private educational matter. That's the agenda here. And it's not until this country made the investments in public education that we made the great advances that we, along with infrastructure, mm -hmm. the great advances that we have made as a society uh, with, uh, and, and strides in terms of equality, as Sheena was saying. So that agenda of school choice, of investing public monies in private schools, is an agenda to move back to before the era of William McKinley, mm -hmm. when high school education was a matter of private schools rather than public schools. You know, if you look at that, and you look at that time frame you're talking about, it was during that period uh, when, I mean, the average worker in the United States was in danger for his life every day he went to work uh, as industrialization took place. And it took decades and decades and decades for there to be uh, uh, labor law that protect workers in terms of salaries, ability to negotiate, safety, and so on. And 
uh, Montana did pretty darn well in that once we got going. Uh, uh, you know, we have not been a right to work state, which lowers wages, uh, uh, reduces collective bargaining. We have public as well as private collective bargaining. We have a workers' compensation system, unemployment compensation. Uh, uh, we were a very strong union state. That all emerged out of that period, but there's been a lot of erosion nationwide, big time, which, by the way, decline of union households is a direct correlation in the decline of the middle class. It's worth noting. But that being said, how have we done, Farad? Are we still under attack with, uh, on our labor laws and our worker laws? Well, Dan can tell you what's been happening in Wisconsin. But once again, let's go back to the progressive period we're talking about. Unions were a big part of that progressive era. Unions worked alongside with all the citizen groups that we mentioned before. And um, those unions would stand sometimes alongside environmentalists and support environmental laws. And you know what? Those environmentalists would stand up beside unions and support laws and that the unions with, needed the and against right to work, right to work laws. And that's probably the only reason that Montana is still not a right to work state. That's another reason that we enjoy at least higher wages in the state of Montana. But there is something happening here and um, I can't exactly explain why, but we've seen for the last few legislatures an unwillingness of the legislature to abide by agreements that the unions have made with the administration. And I, public employee unions. The public employee unions. And, and I don't know, Dan, you've been watching well, this from the outside. Well, doesn't this, you know, that, that it looks as though the legislature is saying you can have these collective bargaining uh, agreements, but they don't mean anything. Now, in a, in a, doesn't that sound kind of like a, a, um, a, a kind of disguised or watered down version of what Governor Walker did in, in Wisconsin in 2011 when he um, uh, re, uh, re, uh, re, repealed the ability of uh, public sector unions, uh, uh, principally teachers unions, to bargain for certain wage and benefits? And they said basically, and they formally said, you cannot bargain for these things. You will no longer, you can bargain for other things. But he made the unions meaningless. And, he, and so that was, that was called Act 10 in that state. And that act basically outlawed uh, any meaningful collective bargaining by public sector unions. But in a more subtle way, isn't this the same kind of thing to say, we won't fund what you have bargained for in the collective bargaining process that was otherwise provided in law? We won't respect your 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 right to bargain. In effect, doesn't it's doesn't it echo some of the same? It may not change the law, but it has the effect of undercutting and undermining the collective bargaining process. Without that, question, yeah. rather than passing the explicit law as they did in Wisconsin, it seems to have the same result. We won't we won't respect your right to collective bargain. Well, in terms of. Well, I like to say once in a while the barbarians are at the gate in terms of trying to make these kind of changes. Every year, the right to work surfaces, but it's been successfully beaten back in Montana for a, lo for a number of reasons. But some other things have happened. In the 1990s, a th little thing called project labor agreements, which is a, where a public contract building public facilities could have an agreement that said it would be union level wages and union level uh, uh, maybe unions involved in the workforce uh, was made illegal. It's not even optional anymore. It's illegal in Montana. Uh, the, uh, the prevailing wage rate is always under assault. Uh, when you look at workers' compensation, uh, it's full of exemption after exemption after exemption. If uh, Minimum wage, which doesn't help most organized workers, but it's for real regular folks, uh, exemption. If you work in this or this or this or this, the minimum wage doesn't apply to you. So workers' protections, workers' security are under assault, it seems to me, an awful lot. Uh, not just around the nation, but in Montana as well. And privatization is part of it. Oh, I, I yeah. should say, in just speaking from a little experience, um, I, uh, I had the opportunity to 
roll back a, a privatization contract uh, in, uh, in, that was in existence in the agency that I was a part of here in Montana that wasn't working well. And we brought the work back into uh, the staff of the agency that was unionized. And when all was said and done, we had four times the productivity from our own staff than from the privatized contract, a better result for Montanans. But the other part of it, in terms of my career in management, both the, uh, in, in experience, including experience here in Montana, is, is that when you have good collaboration between management and workers, you mm -hmm. get better results for everybody, not only for the organization, but the, for the people, you're, more importantly, that you're trying to serve. And there's a lot of literature and research on how collabor collaboration in the workplace, which quite frankly, Germany, very prosperous and succeeds in continuing to adapt and be prosperous, has a whole, has a whole different system of, of labor management cooperation that is much more extensive than any, than any place else. And as a consequence, they, uh, these, pro these progressive relationships with their workforce re results in better results for their economy and for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be very unusual that in the supposed name of economic progress, there are these efforts made to, uh, in fact, instead of having greater collaboration in the workforce, which means organizing the labor force in part, part of that is that, instead of doing that to in fact destroy that and cause great strife and conflict in, in, to replace it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, seems to, it, it seems to be counterintuitive based upon historical research, actual experience, and, uh, and studies that have been made mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. And that it's a step backwards from the standpoint of the good of society. Well, I'm just going to say, I think the whole question of what that does to morale of, of public workers and, you know, the work that's important that these people do every day, that, you know, prison guards, I mean, all the people do every day of their lives. They work hard and this whole tenor <clears throat> of things that this lack of collaboration, this lack of respect for that work, it just, you know, it feeds a... A morale well, that shows itself in a, a, another interesting venue, and there's two other areas I want to cover very quickly before we wrap up here, and that is that uh, as what's been going on uh, in, in recent years has led to a disaffection of the electorate from the government that it elects, and voting uh, people percentage people voting has been going down. Uh, voting rights are under a little bit of assault. Uh, dark money is in elections. Uh, people don't want to have a strong commissioner of political practices. They don't want to stop dark money. Now, we, by the way, the recent legislature just did a wonderful job of right. doing something about that. Uh, we had a ni 1995 campaign finance law that has been gutted, but now it's been reestablished some controls. Uh, uh, voting rights of being able to have same-day registration, there was an effort to get rid of that, went on the ballot, the people slapped them back. Right. People said, we do want rights to vote. We do want to be able to participate, but is that an area where we have to be vigilant? Uh, well, I think the 2014 election was disappointing. Um, I think young people had great hopes for President Obama, and when those didn't, it didn't uh, the miracle didn't happen um, through no fault of the president, but, but aren't uh, the people in Montana uh, progressive? Has that shown itself on the ballot? Well, it has, as a matter of fact. And I, um, in addition to the same-day voter registration, which we kept on by voting the correct way in 2014, we started back in, tw in 2006 when efforts to pass an increased minimum wage in the legislature didn't make it year after year after year. It was on the ballot through a public initiative, and the people passed, did it. People did it. They put minimum wage. Um, we expanded the children's health program, the Healthy Montana Kids, um, passed by more than two to one margin in 2008. The people did it. Yeah, people did it. And people got tired of what payday lending was doing to our, our, some of our most vulnerable citizens. And in 2010, people got rid of payday lending. Um, and in 2012, we responded to Citizens United with a ballot initiative that said corporations are not entitled to constitutional rights. The people did it. 
So I think it's there's some hope there. The hope may lie with the people. The hope lies with the people, exactly. You know, it's a very interesting uh, thing. As long as the people are not dissuaded from participation by this constant ongoing erosion and mm -hmm. fighting by people who have a lot of money, it yeah, gets money, a little bit tough. Money is a huge issue with both these ballot initiatives and in elections in general. Well, we're going to have to wrap up here. Uh, I want to ask each of you, what would be your recipe for success moving forward in terms of maintaining progressive advancements in Montana and power and, uh, to the people of Montana? Well, people have to maintain the power to themselves. When you've got only 40% of the people voting, that's not the way to keep power to yourself. People need to register, they need to vote, they need to ask candidates questions, they need to hold them to those answers, they need to watch, and if you want this to stay the last best place, you need to be an active citizen participant in your government. Sheena, what would be your... I think obviously what Hal said covers a great deal of it, and I think it, it comes down to paying attention. I know people don't have time. They're tangled up with their personal lives, they're tangled up at work, there's just, there's just not enough time to focus on the issues that are impacting you, but you need to pay attention. You need to read the news, you need to talk to people you trust. If you don't have time to read the big thick report about something that you're concerned about, find people who do know, they'll talk to you about it. Um, issue groups, I mean, I just think what happened with Medicare expansion, Medicaid expansion in Montana, the organization that came together to bring that coalition back in, you know, bring a huge coalition of people together, again, to do the collaboration that Dan talked about, resulted in a, in a, a great success, a compromise, but a success. But people have to pay attention. Against make huge money influences, huge, yeah. huge money influences. Dan, your thoughts about what, what should people do? What should, how do we keep what we, our gains? Well, I, I agree with everything that Hal and Sheena have said and just want to echo it a little bit, but I think there's some responsibility for those who have the time and the knowledge to lead in uh, a progressive direction, to work on making sure that they build a movement and not a, 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 a just work on a niche issue here or there, but they build the kinds of coalitions that Hal talked about e uh, earlier of, of labor standing up for the environment, the environment standing up for labor, and all standing up for the human rights of ordinary citizens, especially those who do not have the voice that they need in society or the role that they need to be able to be contributing members of society. The vision of the common good needs to be communicated in a way that shows that everybody has a stake in it and if they all work together, it can be, uh, uh, it, it, the society can be improved. One last thing, much more transparency in government, especially about corporate matters, opening up tax returns to a greater degree and other kinds of things like that so people know. Well, I want to thank all three of you for participating with this and I want to finish with a closing thought and that is that these progressive changes fit well with the people of Montana. There's no question. They show it at the ballot box even now, the willingness to do that. And so perhaps it's time for those who are interested in progressive change in Montana to not always be on the defensive trying to stop the retrenchment, but to push for more progressive change for this marvelous state. Thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.